tonight. I injured my hand slightly, which I certainly not in any intention of uh, trying to amass any sympathy, but I'm not working in anything like watercolor or oils tonight because I have a slightly, I have a fractured bone in my hand, but it isn't going to affect the right hand, which is where all of this comes from. So uh, I wasn't here last week because of this injury. Here I am back and um, I'm going to do some requests tonight, meaning that um, people call, children particularly, call and ask me to draw certain things. So I'm going to do those tonight. If you have any uh, questions and uh, any requests, if I can possibly answer them or if there's any time to answer any special requests tonight, I'll be glad to do them. But I'm going to do E.T. and I'm going to do a pirate ship for a young man uh, who is in Mather Hospital as a victim of an, uh, of an accident, and he's been there a long time. His name is Frank Columbia. And I'm going to do a pirate ship for him and then take it up to him tomorrow morning. So his sister Eileen had called me and asked me if I would do that. So that's one request. And then the other one is a young uh, lady who came to the concert the other night of the Zeng concert, which I talked about uh, for a couple of weeks, and she asked me about horses. So uh, those are the three planned activities. Maybe a car for a very, very young voice that called me once. He wanted to know how to draw a car. So uh, I'm working on my drawing pad. I'm working in perfectly ordinary uh, materials, a magic marker pen, a charcoal pencil, and some uh, pastels. So we can get right to the business of, um, of working, and um, I'll start right in with E.T. Now, the first thing that you do, um, where we can, we can wait until this zeroes in on my drawing pad, we can work with a reference material, and which of course is what I have, and you lay it out in a very, uh, well, in a very, you know, rough way so that you can uh, work on uh, details. And when I get to the details, they'll give me a better focus on this, uh, on this thing uh, because uh, uh, detail is what this is all about. So the general shape is what we are after first. Uh, the, expression of the, uh, the expression of the face, I think, is what really is interesting to most people uh, with this little creature. And so you place it on the page in this manner then you be sure that you place uh, its proportion, which is, make, which is what makes all drawing and all painting either good or bad. So you have to lay out your uh, proportions, make sure that things that are supposed to be big are big enough, and make sure that things that are small are small enough. So as you can see, this is pretty much the beginning of a very recognizable uh, character. And this character was, uh, certainly didn't just happen. It was the result of many, many months and the thoughts of uh, the most uh, active um, designing and creative brains in the business are responsible for having created this, per this person, this creature. And so uh, it, that's also something to be dealt with, that when you are dealing with this kind of thing, you have to understand that it, isn't, uh, it doesn't just happen. It's the result of tremendous amounts of input and work and imagination. So I'm, uh, as I say, I'm, well, I'm trying, I'll try and work a little bit uh, more uh, in relationship to the camera. The camera, of course, is slightly at an angle. So we have here the beginning layout, and now I'm going to start to uh, work in the details. Uh, these are very specified features on this character. Uh, they have to be dealt with almost as carefully as you deal with, for instance, the logo of any well-known product. 
there are there are specified details about the Coca-Cola um, uh, logo and about the McDonald's and Arby's and all of these uh, logos that you're so familiar with uh, have very specialized um, rules about how to depict them. And the same goes for this kind of thing. That's why they are so difficult, really, to, uh, to do out of the imagination. They have got to, uh, they've got to be uh, done with reference material. You, oh, there's a call. Okay, let's have a call. Good. Yes, good evening. Uh, this is Andras Bream. Hello, Andras. Um, I'm not positive if you heard, uh, if you said my, uh, my, about my request, because I just got... I you know, just turned on the TV yeah. just a couple seconds ago. Yeah. And I was just a reminder to, um, if you have time, draw me the white person, the white long-haired cat. Okay. Me. I'll try to do it this time, Andras. Otherwise, I'll do it the next time. Okay? Okay. Um, thank you. You're welcome. For drawing the stuff for Ando also. Thank just... you. I'm glad I saw Bye. you the other night. Bye. Bye-bye. Little Andras, that's our, that's one of my young friends uh, with requests, and he wants a white, long, white-haired cat. Okay, well, now, here we are sitting at the table and drawing. A drawing a character uh, that is um, known, very well known, and uh, maybe all the features are not that well known. People simply recognize things, but uh, are not really very often too aware of what they are recognizing. In other words, uh, I think that if you were to ask a lot of people what are one of the main characteristics about E.T., I don't think that you could um, set it into one characteristic. He's got a whole bunch. I mean, he's really, he's really a complicated character. All right, we have a general layout. Let's see if I can, um, if we can make it even more three-dimensional, even realer, which is what we're always after, the, uh, the real, especially if you're a realist. If you're an abstract artist, that's an entirely different, uh, it's an entirely different game. Uh, so we have here uh, the need to make these uh, wrinkles on the nose perfectly believable. I'm working with a charcoal pencil, as you can see, and uh, these wrinkles uh, didn't come from worry from this little fellow. It came from a studio and a sculptor's uh, a sculptor's hand, and they are, uh, they are parts of the features of this little character. And the, um, the placement of the eye, and the size of it, is extremely important, and the fact that it has a lid coming over here. This lid, this is like a little shelf here, and it dise bisects the eye, and this little shelf is very speci specific. So, and here, all of these uh, great folds. Okay, we have another call. Well, good. As soon as I draw these little creatures, there are always lots of calls. Yes, hello there. How are you? Uh, could you draw the Brooklyn Bridge? Could I draw the Brooklyn Bridge? Well, we've just lost a bulb. <laughs> yes, I can draw the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, I hope that we'll have time. What is your name? Don Hilton. Don Hilton. Well, I'll make a notation. John. I'll make a notation right here on my uh, pad. Brooklyn Bridge, so that I don't forget. And if I can't get to it tonight, I'll certainly get to it some other time. All right. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Uh, if anybody wants to, uh, if anybody wants to break, I don't mind having the dramatic lighting. Uh, how, do, how is it on the page? Uh, it's nice. Uh, that's all right. It's, I think that it's probably okay. Do we want to stop and? No, oh, okay, it suits me fine. It's just very dramatic, uh, sort of Vermeer lighting when it's on me, and that's okay. Um, as I say, I'm now working in the details and being very careful to make them uh, real because uh, it's like portraiture. Whether, you're, whether you are drawing a, a, a human face or a horse or even just a character such as this is, uh, the point is that you must keep the characteristics clear. Now, this little fellow has got pale blue eyes. So I'm not going to darken this uh, eye very much because I do have some pastel here and I can introduce a little bit of blue in this color right now. Uh, uh, his eye is quite human. Uh, there's very, very little uh, animal look about this eye. It's a very soulful, uh, big, pale blue eye, which is certainly more human than it is animal. And um, that's probably one of the reasons that people found such a 
such a close uh, feeling for this little fellow because he has human eyes. And the eyes are the windows. Uh, some poet said once that the eyes are the windows to the soul. So here with a charcoal pencil, uh, which gives you a rather wonderful uh, strength to these drawings, to a drawing, uh, be sure to remember that they are messy. You can see I've already started to make a mess over here. And you must keep your hands out of the way of the charcoal because it, uh, it's, uh, it's nothing more than exactly what it says. It's smearable. And uh, in order to be able to get a nice clean drawing, as you can see, you have to be sure that the hand is out of the way. So I'm now going to be shading all of these things. This is an important part of the face. Little people who want me to draw this ET have to be very patient and realize that I'm not going to just knock this out without any, without any thought about shape and form. I'm a cartoonist, but I'm also a portrait painter. And I take any assignment that is given to me, whether it's the assignment of a little creature or if it's the assignment of a portrait of a bank president, I'm going to treat it with equally uh, the same amount of, uh, of detail and care and, you know, um, respect for the subject at hand. So uh, here we are. Uh, drawing and painting it should be very uh, clearly um, talked about as far as time and the willingness to put in the effort. I find that a lot of uh, uh, craft today are expected to be done in a great hurry. Well, uh, good craftsmanship uh, can't be done in a hurry. You have to give it time and you have to give it uh, dedication. So uh, we'll use ET as, this, uh, as the subject matter tonight for the uh, for the business of, of dealing with um, quality and diligence uh, over a particular, on a particular subject. Uh, be sure to um, understand that there is a lot of liberties that you can take when you're doing this kind of thing, providing you stick to the, the overall pattern, uh, namely the characteristics, and one of them is the is the, uh, de is the attention that must be paid to these folds. And that they make sense. They have to make sense. If they go up this way and they come down, they've got to make sense underneath here and, and be sure that they, um, that they are clearly understood as to what they are. So here we have, I'm going to introduce a little bit of color because I did bring some pastels tonight. But for the most part, this... Uh, this little character is um, lizard-like. He's brownish, and uh, he doesn't have scales, but he does have wrinkles. Let me see if I can make this. See, as soon as you, in, soon, soon as you put in some darkness, you're going to find that this uh, drops down and recedes into a, into a goes, it goes down like that. Okay, now uh, the, um, oh, I see that there's something here that comes, the, all right. Let's see if I can't get that clearer to you, all right. As you can see, uh, a drawing is a drawing, uh, but it becomes a little bit more than a drawing as soon as it gets shading. It becomes three-dimensional and becomes uh, full of texture. Uh, texture is one of the um, one of the crafts which must be learned and uh, studied, or self-taught, such as I am. I'm self-taught because I'm interested in textures. I'm interested in the uh, in the um, in the various surfaces of things, whether it's the skin of an onion or if it's the shine of a pearl, or the um, fuzziness of fur. I'm interested in textures, and that's one of the reasons probably that I'm going to be spending some time doing this drawing for you. And you can see that with charcoal, you can get a lot of very dramatic color just with black. You can see that things are shining here, and that the uh, folds of this little creature cast a shadow. And I'm smearing uh, the charcoal with my finger to make it softer 
where it needs to be. I'm sure that you can also hear this pencil. Ah, we, uh, we have an, a, new, a new light. Now, here is these, these are these heavy folds. Now, I think as long as we've gone this far, we can probably, um, I'm going to put a little bit of shadow in here. You can see how that makes the nose um, stand up. And then also to put the back of the neck. Uh, I, I, I find that um, I didn't plan this as I should have because I don't have enough room on the page. But uh, I'm going over to the other side, and that's okay. Now. Here are pastels. Uh, this is, um, let me see, uh, what is a fairly, fairly good uh, ET color. Let me see, I don't think I, yes, I have some ET color here. We can use this, I'm gonna use the size. See, my hand is so awful with that big bandage. I'm going to put this, this is just an ordinary uh, piece of um, blackboard chalk. Phone call, okay, we can color this fellow in a minute as soon as we finish the call. All right, yes, hello there. Hello, Pat. Yes. Hi, my name is Diane Cuccinello. I'm calling for my son. He's uh, a little bit shy to talk. Diane? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, he wants to know if you could draw him a dragon. Oh, I've done dragons an awful lot on this program. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, of course I could, and, uh, and you know, I can plan what? it for the future. What is, this, uh, what is this shy young man's name? Jeffrey. All right. Jeffrey's very young. Uh, well, he's nine, but he's shy. <laughs> Well, that's okay. Being shy is no crime. Okay, well, Diane, I'll certainly think about doing a dragon. I did one last year and I did one the year before that and so on, but I'll be glad to try yes, to do one sometime at my other request programs. Uh, okay, thank you. Anything else? Um, anything else you want? Speak up, Jeffrey. Have a <laughs> All right. Well, that, I, uh, he wants to know if you could draw a Siamese cat. Siamese cat. Yeah, well, yes, I'm going to do a white, long-haired cat for, for another young fella. So we'll see. We'll, we'll have a whole bunch of animal requests one of these days. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank right, you. Bye-bye. Bye. So, um, as I say, uh, you don't need much, uh, much equipment. Uh, what you really have to have in order to be a, uh, a working artist is, uh, well, first of all, the desire to earn your living as an artist. Uh, the uh, willingness to possibly not make as much money as other people do. I know that, uh, that uh, some artists make a tremendous amount of money, and then again, uh, sometimes I hear that people who operate bulldozers and road building equipment make a great deal more money than artists do. So you have to be willing to give that up uh, until you reach the time when you really can uh, make a lot of money at it, and that's possible, people do. I understand that the man that, uh, that uh, invented and produced the film, E.T., which we are working on now, a young man by the name of Steven Spielberg, at 37 years old, was able to give $6 million of his own money to a, the building of a uh, television facility in uh, California. He gave $6 million of his own money to putting up, uh, I've quite forgotten the name of the... Um, uh, well, of the facility, but it's an enormous uh, television studio complex in which film for television and other film uh, is going to be made. And, uh, of course, uh, that's rather remarkable to think that a fellow who is not yet 40 years old is able to give $6 million uh, for, a, uh, for an institution. Uh, it's not an institution, it's actually an enormous, it's going to be an enormously successful sound studio. So, uh, Art uh, does pay off. Uh, yeah, film is an art form, and uh, this uh, Steven Spielberg, I, um, I'm convinced, is, is a total artist in every sense of the word. Uh, as you can see, this is taking more and more shape. I have left uh, an, un, an unpasteled area up here, which gives the illusion of a shine, which is what we were after. 
to make this fellow shiny and I'm going to leave the top bridge of his nose uh, without color. That will take care of the shine. The uh, process of using um, pastels is different from using oils because you, um, you leave the blank space for white, whereas in oils you apply white to make a highlight. But in this, in this instance, you leave the paper. So, as you can see, one also has to use some blending techniques to make it um, three-dimensional. And you, uh, you do it back and forth. Now, the top of his nose appears to be very, very shiny. So we're going to leave that all white. And the, uh, the um, uh, white of the eye is extremely white, which tells you that he's a very healthy fellow. Your eye, if your whites of your eyes are nice and clear, then you are blessed with health. So here is uh, the, uh, the um, pointing up of the eye uh, white being very clear by surrounding it with darkness. I think that I had probably better use a little bit of dark pastel here to give even more uh, light around the eye. Nothing is white unless it's surrounded by dark. A, uh, a simple th uh, th uh, formula to remember that if you want to make something shiny and you want the highlight to be extremely clear, you must put it on a dark spot. Now I'm giving him a little bit of color in his cheeks. Don't know if he had it. I don't recall if he had color in his cheeks, but I rather like it. And. Um, Let's see, what else can we give him here? A little bit more darkness around the eye. Make that really stand out. And accentuate these folds. A little bit of color on this thing. Well, it would seem to me that this was a pretty comprehensive uh, drawing of E.T. I don't suppose, I, I mean, I could go on and on and on for many, many hours and just keep uh, adding to this uh, to this drawing, but I don't think it's necessary. I think that we've accomplished about all we need to, to show you the sort of the technique of how you go about uh, drawing uh, a little character like this. Uh, let me see, just a little bit more of darkness under here. And then we'll go on to another request, and namely something entirely different, but still in the realm of, uh, well, today it's fantasy. There was a time in world history when pirates were not a fantasy at all. Pirates were definitely uh, a menace. And uh, the, uh, but it's still a very romantic menace. People look upon pirates as uh, an era in which everything was very glamorous. Actually, I suppose that it was far from that. It was hardly glamorous. It was a probably very difficult. Well, so long, E.T. Bye-bye. We'll see you a, bit, a little bit later. And I'm going to now uh, go on into another uh, business of drawing something from reference material, because I don't happen to have a pirate ship here in the studio that I could work from life with. And um, so let me, go to, uh, let me go to the general layout of this kind of thing, once again, using a uh, charcoal pencil. I did uh, a painting of a boat uh, a couple of weeks ago, and that's where this request came. came from this young man who wanted me to do a painting of a boat, but he wanted a pirate ship. So we're going to do it uh, not, quite as, uh, not quite as seriously in this. Let me, let me cut the, um, let me cut the um, string from my charcoal pencil. Not cut my finger at the same time. Uh, all right, the first thing one does is to place the masts. And to get movement into something, you must introduce the diagonal. So uh, movement is going to be uh, immediately um, accomplished by having diagonals. OK. We're going to place the sails, the nearest ones to you, so that you know where they go. And we're going to give them a lot of swing, uh, um, a nice lot of uh, active curves, so that they can um, give the illusion that this is moving. We're also using a, I'm also using a slightly illustrative technique, namely putting curves where straight lines ought to be. Maybe we should get a little bit more uh, close than that. And uh, then we have, of course, the uh, fabled crow's nest, which we must put up here. And that can be indicated by a, 
uh, oh, just a black mass in which you know somebody would climb up in peril of his life to, um, to read the horizon and see what victims were out there ready to pounce upon. Um, of course, all pirate ships looked like other Volkow? Yeah, okay. Let's do that while well, in the midst of my pirate lecture. Yes, good evening. Can I help you? Oh, hello, Mrs. Windrum. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. I wanted to thank you for demonstrating the limited palette that you did. Good. A couple weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Very helpful. I went out and bought some Fine. CNS. Fine. I recognize the voice. Right. Your name is Kathy? No, Susan. Susan, right, okay. Yes. And you're see uh, seeing you shading with your finger reminded me... Uh, I came across something that you can use for shading. If you don't want to use your finger or you have to, you know, shade an area that's too small, say, to get your finger in. Called it, a paper stump? That must be what it is. It's gray and sharpened on both ends. Yeah, it's a funny word. It's called a paper stump. Oh, okay. I and know. it's nothing more than rolled soft paper, usually gray in material, yeah. and rolled in such a manner that uh, it, um, well, you can un unwind it. Oh, when you one, need to. Yeah, seems to be sort uh, of Have compressed. you been using a paper stump? Pardon? Have you been using one? I have used one with charcoal, and it's very handy. Oh, yes, wonderful. So are Q-tips. Oh, yeah, I never thought of that. I guess yeah, the long-handled ones, of course. You're yeah. not going to go messing around with the little tiny short ones. But uh, actually, the most immediate thing that I know of is my finger. Yes. But it does get messy. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, Anything else, warning Susan? your watchers about how toxic oil paint is. I'm working with oil paint now. It's toxic. Yes, it's, it's terrible. Well, uh, you know, I'm not sure that all of them are toxic, but you should treat them as if they are. Yes. Uh, the most toxic, of course, is flake white because it has a base of lead. Yes. Uh, titanium white does not have a base of lead. It has a base of titanium. Yeah. Uh, but all of these things that are ground in linseed oil and have a base and are soluble in turpentine can't be good for you. Yeah. And they should certainly, they certainly aren't good for your clothes or the furniture. And so one of the things that I always say when I talk about working in a, an enclosed space, such as a studio, uh, to be sure that there's enough ventilation, never eat when you're painting. Yeah. And um, clean your hands as soon as possible after, uh, as soon as you get paint on your hands, clean them. Because if you have any kind of an open sore, a hangnail or a, you know, or sorry, I have a cut on my finger here, where I'm, put a band-aid on immediately and don't let any of that paint get near the open cut. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to thank you for that mostly. Oh, well, that's very kind of you to call, Susan. Thank you. I'm glad that we at least also had a chance to talk about the toxicity of paints. I have nothing toxic here except this magic marker. These are lethal. These are absolutely lethal. They are, have a terrible fume coming out of them, and I hope that I never see a child in a classroom using them or ten children using them because they emit an absolutely terrible uh, fume. Yeah. And I, it's, it smells to me like it's toluene, so that's even, bad news. Yeah, even your latex-based paint seems to have bad fumes. Yeah, yeah, everything has bad fumes, and, uh, uh, you know, ventilation is the secret and the answer to all of those problems. Yeah, and you. also to keep clean, you know, yeah. to keep your hands and, your, and yourself clean as you're painting. That's why smocks were invented, I expect. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, anyway. Please get okay. back to your little critters. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Fine, thanks. Goodbye, Susan. Okay, well, um... Uh, now, let's get on to this business of this, uh, of this uh, boat in which we are trying to create the illusion of movement. And the illusion of movement is done by uh, curved lines, diagonal lines, a lot of spontaneous uh, forms such as these. In other, you know, we know that all of these sails are absolutely square pieces of cloth. However, uh, when the wind uh, plays with them, they turn into these wonderful um, curving shapes and they cast wonderful shadows, such as this one will probably cast a shadow resembling something like this, and then you can uh, be sure that you remind yourself that that's a shadow and not another sail. And then uh, this um, has a um, shadow from the light up above from the sky and you put that in to make and, and just sketch it in to make it this is technique this is called the technique of of um, 
of, 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 of putting shadows in places where you wouldn't, uh, where you ordinarily wouldn't remember to do it. But when it occurs to you, do it. Put your shadows in. Here are these sails in the back. You can have them uh, go way off into a nice, uh, well, a nice fluid movement and give it another nice curve like that. This all comes from a lot of years of technique and so on and working with uh, very wonderful people in, namely, really, the, the animation studios. But um, I like to pass on as much as I can uh, to this uh, audience because I don't think that you get a lot of this information in classroom work. As a matter of fact, I'm jolly well sure that you don't get all of this gratuitous information in the classroom. So um, the point of this show, which I do, incidentally, uh, free of charge, this is a voluntary um, uh, effort on my part. I neither have a sponsor nor do I have any funding from anywhere. So this is all, this is all a sort of what you might call a public service. Now we're going to give this boat a nice, oh, a nice fluid movement here. Be sure that we remember that the um, the prow uh, is um, is nicely curved and look as though it's really riding some remarkably uh, dangerous ocean, which is what this is what what everybody wants on these on these boats. And this tends to be a little bit cartoony, of course, but. Um, uh, we're trying to satisfy the request of a young person. Uh, if I was going to do a serious pirate ship, I would go and get reference material of the Golden Hind or uh, some of the lovely uh, four-masted sailing schooners of the time and adapt it to a pirate ship. And as I was saying before the phone call came, all pirate ships, ships looked exactly the same as any other ship. The only telltale thing was when they decided to reveal their identity, they would raise a flag. And that flag, of course, we all know, was the skull and crossbones of pirates. And those were great big black uh, affairs with uh, crossbones. And I'm going to just lay that out here and put this crossbone here, and then a great skull above it with two, with two eyes. And then the flag was, of course, was very dark and threatening and, and evil looking because it was black. So uh, as I say, uh, anybody who wants to do a drawing of a pirate ship, uh, rely upon the reference material of any classical uh, sailing vessel of the um, 18th or the 19th century, and all you have to do is to turn it into a pirate ship by hanging or flying a, um, a skull and crossbones flag from the mast. Now, naturally, we have the need to secure these, uh, these masts and they become secured by going from here down to a point on this mast, and then from here down possibly to there, and from here down to here. And then, of course, there were the infamous ladders, rope ladders, which, um, up which poor unsuspecting victims would have to climb and then maybe even jump to their deaths in the seas below. But the ladders are very important. They are characteristic of the boat. Naturally, the sailors on board, who were many times indentured, they were just gathered on the shores of ports and um, kidnapped, as it were, to go aboard these pirate vessels. And as soon as they were on board, there was virtually nothing that they could do to get off. So they became pirates many times uh, against their will. Well, a, a pirate vessel, of course, probably has a great deal of activity going on, a lot of uh, portholes down here. They even sported cannon, of course, at one time. And um, a good deal of the time, I suppose, they were sort of disreputable and dirty because these people were not serious. So they were serious sailors, but they were not very uh, likable people, and they, you know, they probably did such naughty things, and one of them being that they didn't keep a very nice ship. So I'm going to just kind of insinuate that there are an awful lot of people on board, maybe a, a little man with a sword in his hand here, and a great big swashbuckling hat, and he is um, he's standing on deck, and maybe they're fighting with each other or something. 
but uh, you can indicate all of these little figures on, on a boat with mm, wiggles and little dots and suggested forms which look like they may be people uh, very actively engaged in something on board. Uh, the, of course, the um, most important thing is the size of the hats of those days. Those hats were very telling about the period in history and capes uh, and so forth and of course crowds and crowds and crowds of people because these boats were small and they didn't uh, have as much room as our great big liners do today. They were little and uh, just a handful of people looked like it was an enormous crowd on board. I don't know that much about pirates because um, I didn't go to the movies as much as a lot of people did when they were young. I was not a moviegoer, still not a moviegoer. But anyway, um, this boat uh, has got to be, have a black hull. What? Phone? Have we got a phone call? Oh, good. Let's have a phone call. Let's see what, what we can uh, talk about now. Hello there. Hello? Yes. This is George. Who? George. Jim? George. And the phone is so terrible, I can't make that out. Jeff? George. George. Mm -hmm. Okay, George. I'd like to know where you get your paper from and the special crayons. Well, these aren't special crayons, George. This is a book. This is a book of blank pages. Do you see this? It's wonderful. It's got just nothing but blank pages. Oh, Until I, thought, I thought it was special paper. No, this is a, this is a neat thing. This is a, this is a, a, a hardcover, blank-paged book which oh. is uh, really terrific because it can, be go it can go anywhere. As you see, it has nothing but blank pages. It can go anywhere, and it keeps the drawings clean. And there are about 100 sheets in here, maybe 50 or 100. Oh. And I'm oh. using an ordinary charcoal pencil uh, available in any art store, and some of these are just plain chalk that come in school chalks. These are school chalks. Oh. I was take, I'm taking, I'm taking uh, ninth grade art. It's an elective. And I really like the art class. Good. Well, what school do you go to? Uh, William Floyd. Oh, way out there east of here. Yeah. Ah, do you have a good course? What are you, what are you working on now, George? Uh, right now we're working on perspective. Which? Perspective. Perspective, good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. All right, thank you very much. I'm glad to hear that you're working on perspective. Okay, thank you. Thanks for calling, George. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, okay, so we are now... Uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the midst of working on the hull of this boat and to get a little bit of technique uh, going. Oh, I've lo uh, that's not my charcoal pencil. Well, this is my, this is my, um, this is a grease pencil. It's, a, it's very, very dark, just like the charcoal is. And I'm, I'm, for some reason or other, I picked up the grease pencil. Um, don't forget to make some sense out of these sails. They have got to uh, go someplace. So now we will, uh, we will now um, emphasize the shape of these sails. Before, it was just a layout. What you do is to lay it out with light strokes, and then you uh, amplify it later. Now, sails are held with phone call. Another phone call. Good. Boy, are we popular tonight when we're doing drawings. Yes, hello there. How are you? Hi. Um... My name is Harold, and um, I'm interested if, if you could draw a lion for me. A lion? Yes. Okay, I'll put that down with my other notation about the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, see, I'm taking requests tonight so that I can, uh, so that I can do the show uh, yeah. some other yeah. time. Lion. Okay. Harold? Yes. Is that your name? Okay, uh, when, I, when I get to my request of doing a lion, I will dedicate it to you, Harold. Okay, thank you. Thanks for calling. Bye. All right. Now... Uh, let us uh, let us assume that we have the problem. Let's say that even we want maybe want to work with some color tonight, uh, because drawings are great and they are uh, very effective, and you don't have to worry about schlepping a whole bunch of equipment with you when you're working on drawings. However, color is very seductive, and everybody loves color. So if you can if you can learn a little bit about the use of black and white, and then the slight use of color, it satisfies the need for doing all this wonderful business of uh, carrying colors and paints and turpentine and water and brushes and so forth around. However, let's say that you've got white sails. How do you get white sails to look white on a white page? You don't until you introduce color. Otherwise, you have, sa have to be satisfied with a black and white drawing. So here we're going to naturally use the proverbial blue sky as the background, and I'm using this chalk sideways, as the background to give 
you the white of the sails. Naturally, the, uh, you can hear this chalk is scratching across the page. It's going on very smoothly. And with the uh, technique that I'm using, you can go right over the drawing. Uh, the use of the uh, grease pencil is a nice idea because it won't move when you go over it with pastel. So here we have just the barest suggestion of blue for the sky. But it is giving you what you want, namely the white sails. Some pirate ships didn't have white sails. Some of them had black sails. Uh, I th phone call. Okay, another phone call. Very good. Yes, hello there. Here, where do you get all your uh, painting supplies and everything? Well, I get them in any number of places, but the place that I get them at, of course, is in New York City at a place called Pearl Paint, which is on Canal Street. But the reason I do that is that I use so much color and so much paint. Uh, if you are a child, a young person, and need to buy supplies out here, there is a very nice shop in uh, Setauket called the Setauket Frame Outlet. And then there's a nice art supply shop in Patchogue on, uh, well, it's on that main street that runs parallel with the island. Um, I'm not sure that I remember the name of it, but there are art supply places all over this area. Yeah, thank you. Also, what, what kind of pencils do you like better, the coal or the grease pencils? I like them both. The grease pencils have a certain uh, function and the charcoal pencils have another function. The grease pencils do not smear, so you can't get blending with them. But the charcoal pencils smear, and that means that you can get a nice blend and a nice shading technique. Yeah, can you take a request? I'd like you to draw it. Can you draw the Empire State Building for me? Okay, I'll put that down. What's your name, young fella? Neil. With Neil? Yeah. Okay, Neil. I'm putting down Empire State Building for Neil. And I'll do another request program pretty soon because it sounds to me as though everybody kind of likes this. Yeah, thank you a lot. Okay, Neil, I will, uh, I'll, I'm glad I've got this list. It'll give me a, a nice program to plan for everybody soon. I enjoy your program. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Okay, goodbye. Now we're going to try to finish this. We're running, we're running very nicely. We're, we have uh, a lot of things going on, a lot of calls, a lot of questions, but we're also getting something done here. So as you can see, just with the, with the simple uh, putting in of blue, you've gotten a white sail. I'm going to take this up to young Frank Columbia tomorrow as I go up uh, the Port Jefferson Hill, and I'll drop this off at Matha Hospital for him. I hope it makes him feel better. He's got another six weeks in the hospital in traction. Oh, my, my, what a, what a trial it is for parents and children. And so when, when a child is injured, it is very hard on the child, but believe me, it's just as hard on the parent. So we will, um, let me see now. So we've got, let's make it quite dramatic and give a nice dark color to the ocean, a uh, much darker color to leave the whites of the waves in the front of this boat, and just a lot of nice, brilliant blue for the um, color of the water, assuming that... Uh, because the sky is blue, then the ocean will be blue, but that's not actually so. Where the ocean is most usually dark green and black and brown and everything. It's rarely blue like this. However, we're just going to indulge ourselves and make it a blue sea because this is more uh, an illustration than it is an actual um, realistic rendering of a pirate ship. Now, let us remember, of course, that everything has a shadow. Phone call. Another phone call. Okay, we're going to put some shadows on those sails. Yes, but we'll do that in a minute. Hello there. Who is My this? My name is Michael. Hello, Michael. Um, I would like to know if you can make a request and draw a deer for me. Make a watch. You'll have to say that much slower. Could you make a request and draw a deer for me? A, but draw a what for you? Deer. A deer. Okay. Your name is what? Michael. Michael. You said that before. I'm losing my mind. Okay. A deer for Michael. You mean the kind with antlers and all that stuff? Yeah. Okay, Michael, you're on the list. Okay, I enjoy your show, too. I'm glad you called, and I'm glad you said that. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, uh, we are, we're doing very well. We're going to do, be able to get this, uh, this done. And I've got me some, some uh, color here that I'm going to put on these sails. It's not working very well. Let's find another one. It is nice to have... Um, oh, wah. I did this. Okay. I'm going to make these, uh, these um, uh, shadows a little, bit, a little bit peachy in color, just for variety, because I don't want this to just be an all-blue picture. 
I'm going to take this to my little friend, and um, I think that it should be kept happy uh, as much as possible. With, uh, and my charcoal is now being diluted into kind of a gray, even though I'm using a peach-colored chalk. So you're learning something about that, too, that the charcoal will turn a pale-colored chalk into a nice sort of a warm pinkish gray. Because the charcoal does get picked up, just like when you're working in oils, the oil paint gets picked up when you work on top of it. So we have, okay, another call. Very good. I love being so popular. Hello, and who is this? Stephen. Yes? This is Stephen Cruz. Yes, hello, Stephen. Could I uh, have a monkey? Should I can give what kind? Ah, oh, Stephen, now let's be specific, my friend. What kind of a monkey? Uh, what kind? Uh, a furry one. <laughs> a furry one? A furry monkey. That got a laugh out of his family. Okay. Stephen. Well, I'd like you to know, Stephen, that your request is very ambivalent. That means that uh, you did not give me a specific monkey. There must be 800 varieties, species of monkeys. So I'll pick a monkey, and then maybe you'll be able to accept him as a furry monkey. Okay? Anything else, Stephen? Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I found out the other day on a program on one of the channels uh, that uh, Florida has got an enormous population of rhesus monkeys uh, that uh, are growing and tripling their numbers uh, every year. Uh, uh, there were about 25 of them a few years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, now there are about 86 of them, and they're running wild in the Okefenokee Swamp. And they are a, an enormous um, tourist attraction, but they are native to India. And so uh, that makes it a pretty magical thing to think about, that you've got monkeys in our own state of Florida in the wild. Ten minutes, okay. Now I'm going to just uh, um, heavy up this mast and this one, and I'm running into some problems because a uh, part of this is a uh, grease pencil and part of it is charcoal, and the, uh, the grease pencil resists the uh, charcoal. Oh, it's fascinating. When you use all these different uh, mediums, you find out all sorts of pitfalls and things. Anyway, this is going to be for Frank, and um, hoping that it is going to make him feel a little bit better uh, in his hospital bed. So, we'll, huh? Another one. Good enough. Let's have another call. Good. And who are you, please? This is Robert. James had to call for me. Hi, Robert. Um, can you draw, um... A, a tiger. No, not a tiger. Yeah. Get together, Robert. Can you draw, um... Tiger! <laughs> can you draw a rabbit? A rabbit. Yeah. Uh, you're sure you want a rabbit and not a tiger? Can you draw both? Sure. Okay, now Robert, we will make a notation that uh, that you want me to draw you a uh, rabbit and a tiger. Okay, yeah. we've got Robert. Robert. Robert Rabbit. <laughs> and a voice in the background says tiger. Is that yeah. a brother? That, yeah, that's James. That's Dave. So Dave, Dave wants James. To... Who? James. Gabe? James. James. I, the phone uh, is very distorting. So James must be the name. Okay, yeah. Robert. Thanks Thank for you. calling. You got anything else on your mind? I enjoy the show. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, bye. Bye. Now, because uh, we only have a few minutes, I'm not going to get involved in anything uh, as complex as either one of those things, but I think that it would be nice to talk a little bit about what it is that pirate ships did with their loot. Uh, I, I kind of have a, a sort of, um, well, a kind of teachery attitude about this drawing, that if you draw something, maybe a story is attached to whatever you're drawing. I think that that's pretty true a good deal of the time, that you don't just kind of just draw something. Something always kind of makes a continuation to something else. And so there is a continuation to something else with the drawing of a pirate ship, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. I think I'll just let, I, I think I'll just draw, and if anybody cares to call up and tell me what, what they think I'm doing, that should make this uh, 
maybe just as entertaining as Johnny Carson. How's that? All right, here we go. See if I can't get this in a better angle for you. That's the telltale thing. Okay. All right. Another phone. Okay. Oh my. Here we are. Okay. Let's get to the phone again. We'll we'll take another call. Maybe there's time for just another one. Yes. Hello there. Hello, Pat. Hi. I'd like to ask you a question. Um, because I'm left-handed, I feel like it's harder for me to to do drawings. Yeah. Do you have any hints for people? For any what for people? Hints. Well, uh, no, I think, I think my hint would be probably more a piece of information. Uh, left-handed people, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was left-handed. Do you know who that is? Yes, I do. So, uh, uh, Michelangelo was left-handed. I didn't know that either. Uh, I believe that Andrew Wyeth is left-handed, and maybe even Winslow Homer. So I don't think that there's any need for hints. Your left-handedness is just as capable as a right-handed person. The only thing is that you adapt to having your hand going over the drawing in this direction, whereas I have to have it going over the drawing in this direction. That's the only difference. So there are no hints. The only hints are that some of the greatest artists that ever lived were left-handed. Anything else? Maybe I'll be one of those someday. What? Maybe I will be one of those someday. There's no question if you put your mind to it. Yeah, I guess so. And work hard. I notice your hand. It's yeah. Hard. Well, I hope you feel better. Oh, it's okay. I, I just look dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's one of those accidents that could have been avoided but wasn't, and therefore I have a big old bandage. But it's okay. It'll be all right. Okay. Thanks for calling. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I, I, I cannot uh, tell you how uh, enjoyable it is for me to hear these uh, lovely young voices who are really so courteous uh, a good deal of the time. I mean, uh, tonight we've had a real crop of, of absolute winners, uh, kids that are so uh, wonderful and, 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 you know, full of nice questions and so really courteous. So. Uh, that's what makes all this very much worthwhile. We have here something which is obviously, uh, well, recognizable to all sorts of people. Now, uh, I wonder if anybody knows what this is. I'll put an emblem on here because there was always some kind of an emblem. And maybe uh, coming down like so, the con you must conform to the shape of the thing. If you're going to run uh, this kind of thing on there, you're working in the three-dimensional uh, vein, and so therefore you're going to have that. Now, we've got to put this thing somewhere, and we, have, we don't really know what this thing is because nobody's called to tell me what it is, but I'm going to put it somewhere. And now I'm going to put it somewhere else. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to put one more thing in it that is going to tell you something else about the story of this particular thing. The magic of a pencil, you see, tells a story. 
And I always would supply my boys, I have two sons, my three sons, that when we would go somewhere, I would make sure that I had a drawing pad and crayons and pencils and markers and pens and stuff, because this is the greatest way to pass the time if you're ever in a waiting situation. And um, I think that uh, it's uh, better than uh, Chewing gum, potato chips, and candies and stuff is a drawing pad. What did you say? Two minutes. Okay. Now, we have told a story here with this drawing. Uh, I can tell a little bit more of a story by, by giving you a little bit more uh, background back there. And to tell you that um, maybe this is even better. This is maybe this is a better part of the story. And... Now this part of the story, this is telling something else. And here we have more of the story. Well, we have two minutes to go. This is obviously something that the pirates uh, were involved with when they were off on their nefarious business. Way back in another century, there are pirates now, but they don't look like that anymore. There are pirates now are called hijackers. And um, they do equally as much damage today as they did then. Their methods are just a little bit more lethal, I suppose. And they get to more people. Uh, pirates could only get to a certain number of people because there was a limited amount of people on the high seas. My uh, pencil has now worn down, so it obviously we're coming to the end of the show because even my pencil is giving out. Anyway, we have been playing here this evening with uh, requests and uh, possibly accomplishing two things at once. A request, uh, a uh, get well drawing for a young man who is uh, suffering in a hospital, and also some information about how you go about doing these drawings. Namely, uh, getting reference material, using your imagination, trying to develop and polish a technique, and remembering your mistakes. If you can do all of those things, you're on the, your way to being a creative artist. The person who does not remember his mistakes makes them over and over again and can't progress. This is the end of my program. I'm glad you tuned in. This is Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel in, uh, cha on Channel 6 in Brookhaven Cable TV. Uh, I'll see you next week. This will be rebroadcast on Saturday at 4 in the afternoon. Watch it, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.